we know that all of these so-called archaic paleo Indians that have been found and that are ancient are really our ancestors because we have been living in this area for thousands of years and these are our, our ancestral peoples. So we have to work together as the Pueblos to come together with a common understanding, a common policy in getting our ancestor remains back in the ground. The Hopi tribe is technically listed as a Puebloan tribe, but I would like to say that the Pueblos are anything but generic. Indeed, the Hopi tribe, if you look at our social and religious system that we still hold today, is a very complex and diverse group of clans and religious societies. So internally, I can also say that the Hopi tribe is not generic. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, repatriation process, the uh, Zuni tribe is not uh, uh, currently uh, actively pursuing the repatriation of human remains. And this comes about uh, due to uh, cultural reasons. NAGPRA was given to the Native American people like a one-size-fit-all glove. I think right now all we're trying to do is um, make that glove fit and work. Hello, I'm Conrad Chino from Acoma Pueblo. The Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act is an important piece of federal legislation. But it's also important to understand the tribal perspective on this law, especially here in the Southwest. And that's what we hope to do with this video presentation. The religious leaders uh, were very disheartened when um, you know, they hear of um, you know, sacred objects out in museums, um, institutions, and uh, they felt that uh, in order for um, the benefits to not only um, come to Zuni, but uh, throughout the world to put the world back in harmony. Uh, they felt it was very necessary to return uh, the war gods. When you take certain things, few, uh, ceremonial objects, uh, religious objects, uh, from, their, from within their context, then you, in essence, kill a part of the religion. And some of those things need to come back. For many years, students, curio collectors, art dealers, tourists, and anthropologists bought, traded, and took ceremonial objects important to the southwestern Indian people, the Navajo, Apache, and Pueblo. Many of these objects found their way into local and national museums, galleries, private collections, and even into foreign museums where they are treated simply as art objects or Indian relics. In many cases, these artifacts were removed wrongfully or illegally. They were exhibited in poor taste and out of context and without consideration for the role they played in the culture. Many tribes prior to NAGPRA attempted to recall the religious and ceremonial properties and had asked museums to remove skeletal remains from exhibitions with little or no success. And archaeologists went and dug up these uh, ancestors of ours and, um, and stored them in, in museums and studied them and things like that, you know, that upset the people and, and it kind of fostered uh, some anger and bitterness amongst them. In November 1990, Congress passed the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. NAGPRA mandates that all American museums, supported by federal funds, inventory their collections of human remains and religious and ceremonial objects and report their holdings to Native American groups. Now that most museums have completed and distributed their inventories to tribes, it is up to the tribes to review and claim, if they choose to do so, their cultural properties. Tribes are not forced to claim, but those who wish to claim can do so under the guidelines of the law. 
There are no time constraints on the tribes to make their claims. In fact, there has been no rush among most southwestern tribes to repatriate. The law, as it's written, seems to provide an easy way for tribes to recover cultural properties from museums. But here in the Southwest, the law seems to have created a lot of confusion and difficulty for those who are supposed to benefit from these regulations. For example, there are no related concepts in many Native American languages for some of the key words in the law. Words like ownership, patrimony, affiliation, associated and unassociated funerary objects and rights of alienation are virtually unknown. But if you talk to traditional community people, and I think very few would know the word NACPRA, uh, very few would understand its uh, implications involving their cultural resources. Uh, cultural affiliation, I think, is one thing that um, it's at a point where it needs to be uh, discussed a little further and uh, I just hope it does not get into uh, anything like a legal uh, bind. Uh, it has um, you know, created uh, controversy among the uh, Athabascan and the uh, Pueblonian uh, uh, groups and I think this matter um, is a very sensitive issue because of oral history and ceremonies that came from places like Canyon de Chez, uh, Chaco, and Mesa Verde. And for this reason, we, we take cultural affiliation um, very seriously. Being a Navajo, and I've talked to a lot of other Navajos, we do not believe in, in the Bering Strait um, theory that we've been here, we've always been here. NAGPRA, while well intended, has created also some very unique problems for the Hopi people. So today as we now get into the politics of cultural affiliation, I'm very interested in having research deal with again non-sensitive collections such as pottery shirts around research themes that the Hopi tribe can benefit from pottery shirts can indeed help the Hopi people because in our migration traditions there were some very specific traditions and teachings that along with how we migrated throughout what we now know as our ancestral homeland. One, the shattering of pots was very deliberate because one day we were told those footprints will become very important for the Hopi people. Hopi say if but one pottery shirt remains at a site, it will still tell a story. Even when a word is known, the understanding of it may be completely different. The term sacred, for example, has a different meaning for a non-Indian than for a Native American. Non-Indians frequently ask, is that site more sacred than the one over there? Which is the most sacred part? Or is this object more sacred than another object? To a southwestern Indian, the entire universe is sacred with no part being more sacred than another part. All things natural or created for religious use are sacred, no matter how small or insignificant they may seem to others. Everything is sacred. This worldview is the very essence of southwestern Indian spiritual life and power. Reclaiming human remains has created a difficult and oftentimes emotional situation for southwestern tribes. That's because some are having to create new systems, possibly new rituals for reburial, something they've never had to do before. Among the Pueblos, Navajos, and Apaches, death and burial ceremonies are private and clan associated. After prayers are said, the spirit of the dead person is sent off forever. So to remind someone of the dead by returning bones and other human remains desecrated by removal is unheard of. That is, until Nagra came along. Here in the Southwest, Indian people believe that returning human remains could create a spiritual danger and difficulty for the living. So what you'll find is that Pueblos, Apaches, and Navajos may be reluctant to reclaim human remains from museum collections. Uh, in history, where many times there was conflict 
with some of the uh, nomadic uh, warring groups uh, where raiding took place and uh, of course in these conflicts uh, lives were lost and so in the Zuni view to bring in the remains of the enemy uh, may, be, um, may have um, uh, negative ramifications. Um, the Zuni tribe also feels too that uh, if we do bring in remains um, that we do not have a ceremony to return them to the uh, Mother Earth. The funerary rite is something that is uh, you know, very uh, private uh, and it is a, a sad event. There's uh, much uh, ritual and obligation fasting that is involved and uh, so at this point to make a connection with a human remain to a family or a group uh, it, it would be quite difficult and to have um, a family or a group to take on you know the fasting obligation the ritual uh, it is something that is a, a very serious nature and uh, most likely uh, um, no uh, Zuni family or group would come forth to to do this Growing up in a traditional world, a traditional way of life, and working with NAGPRA and working for the, for the Historic Preservation Department, um, as far as working with sacred bundles and sacred objects and uh, I, uh, items of culture patrimony, it's been consistent. We haven't had any problems. But like I said, when we get to, to um, human remains, and then that causes a big problem for you know, for traditional people such as myself. Whomever has these human remains, that it is now in their possession. It is their responsibility to manage and care for them. And that we'll hold them to that until the time becomes that we can work together to take these, our human remains out of their position and get them reburied at home. In the Southwest, tribal, civil, and religious leadership are usually two separate entities. Repatriation of human remains and sacred or ceremonial objects involves decision-making by both groups. Usually all NAGPRA matters are channeled through the elected or appointed tribal officials and then to the religious leaders. The religious leaders, in consultation with the appropriate tribal elders, decide on the matter and inform the governor and council, who then convey the decisions to the museums. This is not always the case, however. Although they share elements of a common history and culture, each Pueblo and tribe's civil and religious structures have evolved independently. Frequent changes in leadership also create problems and delays in the NAGPRA decision-making process. Fifteen tribes have annual administrative turnovers. Some have elections every two years, and one group elects leaders for four years. In some groups, civil officials are appointed by the religious leaders and or elders and in some, they are elected. Each new group of officials must come to grips with a complex set of problems resulting from the NAGPRA legislation. One of those problems is limited resources. A few tribes, like the Zunis, the Hopis, and the Navajos, do have historic preservation programs. But a majority of the tribes don't have the money to hire staff or tribal members to read through NAGPRA inventories. They also don't have the money to travel to view museum collections or private consultation. And even if a tribe did have the money, many tribal groups don't have the knowledge or the expertise to evaluate museum collections or inventories. Many of those inventories are computer printouts from different databases. And making sense of the different formats and the archaeological jargon can be a challenge. We don't have the resources like, like these other tribes do. Like We don't have a cultural preservation office, or we don't have a historic preservation office, or we don't have, um, how would I say, we don't have um, tribal uh, codes or resolutions or things like that, that that say, okay, this is the way you should deal with this issue. You know, this, you sh this is the way you should deal with the uh, inventorying of, of, of uh, funeral remains and things like that. One of the biggest challenges um, that I see is that uh, in our visitations to uh, various museums, um, the East Coast, 
California, um, museums here in New Mexico, Arizona. Um, I found that uh, there are so many uh, sacred items uh, that are in the collections. And um, so for us, that creates a very big uh, task. Um, I know that it is said that um, we do not really have any uh, deadline as far as uh, you know, taking that next step once we've identified these uh, sacred objects and fitting our category for repatriation. Now the matter is, uh, is to actually physically have these sacred items be returned back to, to Zuni. That, that is uh, just looking at the numbers, it goes into the thousands. There is a night way ceremony dish up at the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, that was on display a couple years ago and through consultation work with the Field Museum and us we were successful of uh, taking it off display and storing it in, in, in their storage space the proper way and we wanted to, to get it back and we found out that um, it was treated back in the early 1900s with arsenic and this causes a problem for for the items in us because we like to, like I said, bring it back and put it back into use, which in this case we can't. So we have to consult with our, our Atkathi advisory members and see what we can do about that. When dealing with native communities in the Southwest, it is important to realize that even such apparently clear terms as elders may have a different meaning than in English. A religious elder is not necessarily an older person. The terms and what they mean may vary from tribe to tribe. NAGPRA must also be understood within the many more immediate demands on the communities, such as health care, housing, education, and resolving the legal problems surrounding Indian gaming. Lack of a quick response to the NAGPRA inventories doesn't mean there is a lack of interest. It may mean there is a lack of resources. There is no time limit for tribes to respond to the inventories. It's important to remember that each tribe will deal with the problems posed by NAGPRA differently. One tribe may choose to repatriate, another may decide not to, and that's exactly what has happened so far. At the Museum of New Mexico, we are currently working closely with local Indian communities to determine how to proceed with the NAGPRA process. We have developed a collaborative approach based on working with individual partners from seven tribes. The partners are tribal members appointed to the project by the tribal governor and or religious leaders. The partners work closely with museum staff in processing archaeological materials from their tribal lands. They are able to identify items in the collections requiring special curatorial care. For example, as a result of the partner from Akama's recommendation, human remains and their associated funerary objects are now stored in the same box instead of being separated. The partners also learn about museum practices, archaeology, and record keeping, and are now able to convey this information back to the tribe and religious elders. Thus, the partners can assist their tribes in the evaluations of inventories from other museums and provide some degree of continuity as tribal administrations change. At the tribal level, the partners have no decision-making powers. They serve as liaison people between the tribe and the museum. The partners program has been supported by two grants from the National Park Service. I don't see the museum community really as an adversary at all today, but rather as a resource that really should be available to the Hopi people. So I'm interested in having our own archaeologists. I'm interested in having our own Hopis trained as cultural anthropologists. I'm interested in having our own tribal historians. And I'm interested in having our own archivists Hope is trained, and that's where, you know, again, the Hopi tribe, I believe, is reaching out to the museum community to go forward with, again, this challenge of partnering or partnerships, because I, I, I think beyond the emotion and politics that maybe NAGPRA has caused, I think NAGPRA has also provided a very significant opportunity for tribal and institutional co collaboration. And I think uh, to some extent there's a certain amount of trust that, uh, that they're well, been well taken care of here on, in the interim until the time that we can actually effect their, their barrier. 
what I like to see is uh, hopefully in the future uh, with other museums and institutions is that number one is to consult with the tribes in reference to any of their collections which they house and also giving tribes the opportunity to have input and make recommendations openly and have that respect. I know that Museum of New Mexico has always played that important role. Even though many tribes here in the Southwest share a common world view, you must understand that each tribe has evolved differently. There are many philosophical differences between tribes here in the Southwest, and you must realize that one tribe or one individual cannot speak for another group. A little background on this is that uh, when an individual has come to the end of their life on this earth, you know, they are put into the Mother Earth uh, to begin their spirit journey. And that uh, this, in the Zuni view, is only done once. And with uh, you know, the remains that are now in museum collections, uh, institutions, and sometimes uh, private uh, collections, um, it, it is felt that you know, these uh, remains should rightfully be returned to the Mother Earth. Um, but as far as uh, repatriating, um, remains that have been uh, excavated uh, from uh, Zuni homelands. Um, right now, the uh, Zuni tribe is not uh, pursuing this, and this, as I said, is for cultural reasons. But that does not say that uh, we are not concerned. Uh, we are very concerned with um, you know, the remains that are uh, in collections, wherever they may be, museums, institutions, or even sometimes uh, private uh, collections. We have um, been involved and we will be uh, continue to involve ourselves in the, the uh, discussions to um, as far as the disposition of these remains. Our policy is unwritten, yet we have ways and we insist that it's, come, it's like an unwritten principle that we re have every intentions to have our human remains rebear it so that our peoples who were removed from places on Akama land, even though we may not have a written policy on how they should be treated here or how they should be repatriated back to Akama. That is our goal, to get them back and rebear it. As far as um, human remains, uh, we've working on, we're working with the, the Pittsburgh Midway Mining, uh, Mining Company that um, we're going to try to exchange some land for some of these remains so they can go back into the ground um, if we do repatriate human remains from museums and institutions across the country. Among the key questions that we asked more recently in our resolution is really putting the burden on museums and for that matter the federal government on collections taken from Hopi under in many cases under legal auspices, like under a Antiquities Act permit, on everything that was taken from the Hopi Reservation that subsequently was traded, exchanged, or sold to foreign museums. The Hopi tribe has made it clear that it still has a legal and cultural interest in that property. And we, again, our resolution seeks to, again, find a partnership um, uh, beyond the adversarial kind of relationship, a partnership with museums to, to again deal with this very important question. I encourage museums to administratively deal with some of the requests that the Hopi tribe has made, particularly how to collaborate again with the Hopi people to ensure that privilege and esoteric information that the Hopi tribe is worried about being in public domain can be better managed.
No doubt you've heard the term, one size fits all. Well, that's exactly what NAGPRA is trying to do. The government's attempts to make one set of regulations fit all has created serious misunderstanding, stress, and confusion about the repatriation of religious and ceremonial objects and human remains. Many tribes here in the Southwest feel strongly that those objects should have never been removed or collected from tribal lands in the first place. Pueblos, Apaches, and Navajos want museums to know that they are not dead cultures, but are viable and ongoing. The collection of sacred objects and human remains has been going on for about a century. Repatriation may take many years, perhaps even decades, to carry out. We hope that what you've learned from this video is to speak to each tribe directly, with openness, understanding, and with respect. By educating, um, for instance, museum personnel or um, um, boards of um, governing boards, uh, I think that's one way of um, convincing uh, people that uh, it is important to have these uh, items returned and that's how we've been basically approaching it uh, is through open dialogue and of course uh, this does not happen overnight. Uh, sometimes we've had to uh, negotiate and uh, uh, work on these matters and it takes years. Sometimes we do in fact go into a situation with both guns blazing but we ultimately come out of the saloon with our, whole, our guns in our holsters, you know. I want to um, work with the museum to, to re repatriate our ancestors and our belongings because I want my children to have a culture in which to grow up.